third um, departmental seminar at the University of Sheffield, uh, online version of the autumn of 2020. Um, and we are delighted to welcome uh, you know, <laughs> Who the hell is it's, so it's no, it's the recording thing was just going round and round and round. So all of this uh, very formal uh, attempt at introducing the session uh, for posterity <laughs> and for the recording was completely lost. So uh, we are <laughs> delighted to welcome uh, Professor Liz Camp uh, from Rutgers, uh, who is uh, who works in um, the philosophy of uh, language and mind with special interests in uh, perspectives. Uh, meaning and concepts, uh, who will be speaking to us today on the topic perspectival complacency, perversion, and amelioration. Um, welcome, Fresh Camp. <laughs> it's also odd. Um, okay, so can I? Um, thank you. I'm happy to be here. I do feel like um, you know this is a completely bizarre. Um, uh, set up, but it also really does, I mean, it's, it is genuinely really cool that we can, um, you know, get together and see each other at a lower cost and in a way that might have made it more difficult. So I feel like that is a real asset to me. Um, so I, I'm happy to, to be here. Um, so two things that Max um, mentioned that I wanted to just say a little bit more about um, it, that are my attempt to sort of like take control of this insane, you know, Zoom world and make these talks a little bit less odd for me. Um, one is that as much as possible, if you're relatively comfortable with it, I'd like you to, so I, there's a handout. The handout is, you know, important guide to the talk, um, but I'm not going to screen share. So, because I would like to see your faces as much as possible, so I have some kind of feedback and some kind of sense that I'm not just like recording something. You know. um, so, if you're comfortable having your camera on, great. You know, uh, you probably should keep it on mute except for the the Q and A part. Um, but and then keep the the handout off to the side. Um, the other thing is that in order to make it just a little bit more interactive and present, and whatever, I'd like to have a little bit of conversation after each of the main sections. Um, and so there are four sections. Uh, the first one's really just a quick introductory sort of orientation. And then the second one is a little bit of like the doozy of my sort of theory of uh, perspectives. And then there are two sort of substantive sections about uh, the topic that I want to talk about today. Um, so those really should, I mean, the idea there is uh, what I'd like to do is just like have us make sure we're sort of all on the same page, have some sense that we're together here but uh, more leaning toward clarificatory questions than super substantive questions. I saw somebody ask that in the chat. So that's how I'm thinking about the purpose of these and you know, keep it sort of moving along, but make sure we're all sort of together. So does that make sense? Max, can I, you know, whatever, do people thumbs up, whatever is that? Okay, all right. Um, so, so what I want to talk about today is, um, so, so, you know, I think of myself as primarily a philosopher of language and mind. I've worked on a range of phenomena that um, draw on, that are sort of perspectively inflected, that sort of connect up to issues about perspectives in philosophy of language and mind. Um, and this is sort of uh, bringing, and, and especially I've been interested in what you might call non-ideal cases, cases where there's something, some kind of power dynamic thing going on. It has to do with, you know, <clears throat> Um, uh, messy facts in the real world. Um, and I think of this as sort of this talk and this paper as sort of me um, recognizing and trying to grapple with some of the implications of that more in an epistemological vein, but also a bit more uh, sort of generally, you know, it shows up the sort of language and mind uh, themes show up throughout. So, okay. All right. So now I will begin. Um, so, Perspectives are this, this in, in perspectives understood as intuitive ways of thinking about the world um, are ubiquitous in our lives, uh, in ordinary life, and in theoretical contexts. Uh, right now, I just want to say, like, you know what I'm talking about, right? You, these are the kinds of things we have and use, and that we see. We have conflicts over all the time, right? Uh, you know, everywhere in the world right now, but especially in the United States, there are dramatic clashes of politics that seem like they're um, driven 
much more by deep perspectival differences than by any particular policy difference or you know particular commitment. Um, you might also think that one of the ways in which religions really differ is in their perspectives more than any particular di doctrinal difference. Um, uh, one of the things, so art uh, it often takes up and uh, makes as its topic um, uh, the articulation and the sometimes variation in perspectives. So, you know, think about the difference between the, the Camus Stranger and Evelyn Waugh's uh, Bride Has Revisited. It's not just the settings or the characters or the plots that that's not primarily what's different and interestingly different between them. It's something about like just very different perspectives on the world. And that's part of the point of each of those uh, books uh, is to immerse you as a reader in those perspectives and get you to understand those. And then, uh, I, I, but this is not just something that happens in sort of ordinary um, emotion inflected uh, 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 cognition, which is what you might think given what I said before, different clashes of perspective and differences in perspective and um, exploitation of perspective are also really important in science, right? So you might contrast like microeconomic and macroeconomic perspectives on, you know, uh, well, health uh, or well-being. Um, you might also contrast, you know, um, uh, rational choice theory and behavioral economic approaches to microeconomics, right? So there's, you know, just in what di differentiates those is less any particular commitment, uh, any particular belief, uh, any particular method than a mode of approach or mode of uh, interpretation. Um, so, you know, right now I'm just saying, you know what I'm talking about. There's this touchy, feely, amorphous thing that we have, perspectives that we use in a lot of different domains. Um, and they do a lot of really important work for us. Um, so again, right now I'm just giving you a sort of, you know, highlights and quick orientating orienting touchstones, but cognitively having an intuitive perspective for understanding the world facilitates uh, rapid context sensitive processing from the particular situation you're in to appropriate action, right? If you have an intuitive perspective on the world, you can take information in efficiently and do with it, deal with it in a way that makes sense to you. Epistemically, having a perspective on a domain facilitates navigating a complex body of information in an efficient way. It facilitates recall. Um, um, and it also helps you to develop, you know, justifications and explanations for why some phenomenon obtains. So, you know, you hear a lot in pedagogy, um, theory of pedagogy, about how it's really important to develop, you know, deep understanding and perspectives as opposed to the rote memorization of facts because they're more interesting, more important, and also generative of uh, uh, those more superficial things. Morally, you might think that having perspectives is uh, having an intuitive perspective, an intuitive moral perspective um, is uh, important, crucial, because it motivates uh, recognizing and satisfying other people's uh, goals and concerns, right? So if you intuitively grasp uh, somebody else's perspective, then you can act on their behalf. You're motivated to and effectively act on their behalf. Um, and then communicatively, so just in pragmatics, it's, you know, really obvious that uh, having an intuitive perspective in common, sharing, coordinating on a perspective, um, facilitates rapid coordination on lots of articulated uh, uh, assumptions. You don't have to spell out all the individual things that you would otherwise. So that's all great benefits from perspectives. On the other side, they're, but they are double-edged swords. With those very benefits come commensurate risks um, that uh, uh, are genuine distortions and traps. So cognitively, um, uh, having an intuitive way of making sense of the world can lock us into self-defeating associative habits. You know, many of us sadly have had the experience of coming out of a relationship that we felt was, you know, less than fully productive and saying like, how could I have been so dumb? I had these sort of intuitive ways of thinking about the situation, which I now think to be, have been really counterproductive. Um, epistemically, uh, the sort of more normative correlate of that is is that um, having a perspective on a situation and especially feeling that you understand it can trap you within a realm of alternative facts and conspiracy theories. Um, morally, uh, this feeling of understanding and the um, uh, and the robust patterns of understanding that you display um, can 
um, make us feel self-righteous in our privilege, right? It all makes sense to us. See, we see what we see and uh, we ignore what we uh, don't see. Um, and so we don't see our own privilege, our own, and we're convinced and happy with smug in our uh, privilege. Uh, and uh, uh, and we become self-righteous because of that. And it also can make us, our feeling of understanding can make it incredibly difficult for us to actually understand and empathize with others who are more dramatically different from us, right? Who are other with a capital L. Um, and then finally, uh, communicatively having uh, a perspective, it, it, when we are in a conversation uh, in which there are, uh, is a perspective, um, an operative perspective that um, is unjust or inappropriate, the participation in the conversation can perpetuate that perspective in a way that renders us complicit in it. Um, so those, you know, those are each, I think, direct flip sides of the benefits that uh, uh, perspectives bring. And so, and and the, the sort of rub here is not just that we need perspectives, but they have downsides, but this phenomenon of what I'm calling perspectival complacency, the way in which having a perspective, which really does help you to understand stuff and understand it in this intuitive way, um, and which gives you a feeling of understanding, which then, uh, so that's the phenomenon of perspectival complacency, which is what I want to explore and understand today. The rub is that that is not just causally self-reinforcing. It's not just that we develop habits of interpretation, which we are then sort of prone to, you know, um, reiterate. Um, it's also that they're normatively self-reinforcing. The more we use this perspective, the more it um, uh, appears to be justified to us based on the internal evidence we have. Um, and so uh, there is this uh, deep challenge about how to get out of, how to use the uh, exploit, make the best use of the benefits that uh, perspectives give us while mitigating and figuring out how to handle those downsides, okay? So that is my topic for today. There is this phenomenon, perspectival complacency. Um, uh, it is not just an unfortunate causal fact that we happen to be prone to do um, things with our minds that are uh, distortions, but it is something that can really look good epistemically from the inside. Um, and the question is what to do about it. Okay, so the three sections of the three remaining sections of the paper are say some more about what even is a perspective because you know I right now I just pointed to it and I, you know you know what I'm talking about but it's this very amorphous high level thing and so and it, I threw at you a whole range of kinds of examples so I want to try to say something more about how I think perspective, what they are and how they work. Um, then the next section, the third section is to sort of just explain what is this phenomenon of perspectival complacency in a little bit more detail and what are the other, so there's three risks. I think there's sort of, um, uh, sort of, um, <laughs> both siderism, they, uh, you know, they, there's risk of complacency and then there's an antidote and then there's another risk. Uh, it itself has a risk. So there's this uh, play of risks. And then finally, the last section is what should we do about it? Okay, so that's the first section. Little pause. Are you tracking me? Do we anything we want to talk about now? Through this, uh, hopefully, Jonathan, apparently not uh, intuitive notion at you with a bunch of examples, but that was really just a way of trying to, um, you know, suck you in or orient you and give you some sense of what might be happening here, right? So um, what I want to do in this next section is say a little bit more, if you have these sort of touchstones um, of thinking about what it is to have a perspective on, you know, um, uh, a, a perspective on a domain where, so let me just try to go over this again. Um, think about clashing political perspectives. Think about um, w the difference in perspective between being a Kantian and consequentialist. Um, think about the difference in perspective uh, between being an maybe, I and mean, we can talk about this later, between being an optimist and a pessimist. That's a little bit tougher. Uh, difference between being, um, you know, uh, uh, a fallen Catholic and a, um, uh, a a New Age shamanist, right? So those are. 
things where people have ways of making sense of the world, these open-ended things, um, domains, um, open-ended modes of interpretation of domains. Um, uh, now let me try to say something about what those are and how they work so that we can put a little bit more meat on that and then go forward. Okay, so the way I understand it, a perspective is a clustered set of dispositions to interpret, right? So it is an, um, it's an ongoing open-ended set of dispositions. One, another way of putting it is it's a style of noticing, relating, and responding. Noticing information, relating information and responding to information as we encounter it in the world. So I'm going to go through each of those things, the noticing, the relating, and the responding. Um, uh, so but the important top line thing is a perspective is an open-ended disposition to interpret, right? And so then I'm going to try to break that down into these two, the way you take in information, the way you assimilate information, and the way you respond to information on that basis. So the first thing is that uh, about noticing, right? So I think about this in terms of attention. Um, intention focuses information, it focuses on information of certain kinds. And I think of that as having um, sort of, I mean, there are three thing, three points I want to make, uh, and I bundle that into sort of two stages. So the first thing is that attention parses information into kinds relative to a presupposed taxonomy. So, um, you know, I am simply being, information has no form in itself, right? But as I process information um, and allocate inter information, allocate attention, including at a very low level, you know, perceptual um, processing, um, my brain, my mind, myself is parsing that uh, information in certain ways, right? Relative to a presupposed taxonomy, the taxonomy, the taxonomy classifies, you know, uh, me as encountering uh, the information as of certain types, instances of certain types, in virtue of possessing certain lower order features. Um, uh, and that taxonomy, so that ta taxonomy distinguishes things into repeatable types, uh, which are then, you know, linked into subordinate and subordinate categories. Um, so that's the first thing parsing relative to a taxonomy. The second class of things is not just um, uh, how, not just chunking, but which information is paid attention to and to what degree, right? So we only notice some of the information uh, that comes in as illustrated by like the famous invisible, I'm sorry about the cat, uh, uh, invisible gorilla, uh, where you don't even notice the big guy in the gorilla suit walking through the group if you're supposed to be counting the number of um, uh, basketball passes. Um, so we don't even notice certain things. Attention is selective altogether and then within what we notice some things are more prominent some features some uh, uh, properties uh, objects and events are more uh, prominent than others prominence I understand as a function following Amos Tversky as a function of two more specific uh, features the first is intensity Intensity is high signal to noise ratio. How much does this thing, this feature, stick out relative to the background? The background may be a pretty bare physical, the, the signal noise ratio, the, 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 what determines baseline conditions may be a pretty bare physical thing, like the illumination of light in a room, how bright a light is in contrast to the rest of the ambient light in the room. But very often, um, uh, what counts as intensity is something that's gonna be, you know, high signal relative to baseline where that baseline includes lots of cognitively mediated assumptions, right? So um, my I, if I am a um, you know an art expert, which I am not, then the, my experience of the intensity of a patch of blue in a painting is likely to be a function not just of the actual saturation of that painting of that patch relative to the other patches right around it, but also of my expectations about what paintings of that genre are going to look like, and you know whatever. Um, so maybe cognitive mediation, maybe not cognitive, uh, cognitive mediation. Okay, so that's intensity which is one component of prominence, which is high signal, how much signal to noise ratio there is. 
The second uh, factor in prominence is diagnosticity. Diagnosticity is how useful is this feature for classifying for in, for for classifying relative to your interests, and so that means how robustly do you take this feature to be correlated with some other feature that you really care about, right? And so something could be in principle and in fact uh, a feature can be low signal to noise ratio, can be low intensity, but highly prominent and highly noticeable to you because it matters a lot for you relative to certain purposes. So one of these might, uh, you know, again, so that could be something like, you know, uh, so I, I like not to get, you know, uh, bitten by venomous snakes. I have an interest in not being poisoned by snakes. Um, if I have that interest and um, I happen to know that triangular head and elliptical pupil shape are roughly correlated with, you know, pretty decently correlated with being venomous, those features, the shape of the head and the pupils, are going to be more prominent to me than they would otherwise or if I had, than if I had no interest whatsoever in venomousness. Um, that's a relatively sort of immediate kind of case. You know, you might also think of like a radiologist who's looking at an x-ray for, uh, uh, to try to diagnose cancer, right? Really minute differences, what are in some sense not really um, absolute absolutely intense variations in um, grayscale are going to be really prominent to that, uh, to the radiologist in virtue of their training and their interests. Okay, so we have this phenomenon, prominence, function of intensity and diagnosticity, um, and uh, that takes parsed features which are important enough to be noticed and allocates them differential degrees of prominence. So that's the first, really, that's, that's what I want to say for now about the way in which your perspective influences how you interpret, right? And so you should already be able to see that there are going to be different perspectives, which are going to produce differences in patterns of attention and are going to produce differences, resulting differences in interpretation. Um, and, you know, I can go through that in more examples in more detail if you want, but I'm going to move along for now. So the, that was about how, the way in which an agent takes in information. The next dimension of perspectives that I want to think about is the way in which the agent connects up information together. So here I'm saying explanation, but I'm thinking really the thing I want to talk about is centrality or relating information. So in my thinking, so, so an intuitive mode of control, an intuitive interpretation isn't just uh, like a list of information it's uh, or even one that's like ranked for you know importance it synthesizes information into complex networks right so right now i'm interested in thinking about those networks uh that connect information together um so features are more that are more central are more robustly connected up to many other features in my thinking um so uh and the most sort of the, the paradigm cases of that are forms of explanation, but there are, a, you know, we can also just connect up information in um, disparate uh, features or different uh, experiences of features um, in more basic ways, like through idiosyncratic association, right? Like, so I might bite into a cookie and recall my aunt's gauzy curtains, right? Um, but I also might, um, you know, see somebody's skin color and draw a bunch of conclusions about what uh, a bunch of inferences about what other features they're like to, likely to um, possess. Um, uh, so uh, there are a really heterogeneous variety of ways in which we connect information to uh, up, uh, to itself it, uh, into larger networks. Um, so especially for lot for philosophers, but for scientists and I think for lay people in general, causation is like we really like to posit causal connections. Like you know, causation is a paradigm kind of way of connecting information. Um, mere correlation, you know, statistical correlation is another way in which we like to connect information. Um, but I'm also including here, you know, I want to be really ecumenical about the ways in which we connect information to each other. Um, also material and logical implication. And also these um, normatively inflected uh, and just straight up normative um, modes of connection, uh, moral desert, aesthetic fit, right? So these are all ways in which we think that information, disparate features, Features um, hang together, belong together, make sense together um, in uh, various kinds of ways. Um, okay, 
So that's what I want to say about that. So we take information in in certain ways, prioritize certain pieces of information, then we connect it up uh, to, to each other in certain kinds of ways. Um, and then finally, in light of that, we evaluate or respond to that information. Um, and again, in a range of ways, practical, moral, emotional, aesthetic. Um, so, uh, and those uh, follow upon and uh, uh, again, I think both cause causally and normatively, uh, which information we have um, uh, paid attention to and what uh, kinds of connections we've drawn. So, stepping back from that, those details, uh, a perspective we can now say is an open-ended way of paying attention, synthesizing information, and explaining information, and responding to it in that light. Okay, so that's, you know, a perspective is an open-ended way of making sense of like a whole domain, right, a wider or narrow part of the world. What a perspective produces is an intuitive way of thinking about a particular subject. Um, so I call these characterizations. Um, uh, a character, and I want to link but also importantly contrast these with concepts as philosophers typically think of them. Um, uh, way I think of characterizations is a lot more the ways many psychologists think of concepts. Um, so a characterization is an intuitive way of thinking about a specific topic which collects a complex body of information, um, often including vivid affectively laden features uh, into a holistic multi-dimensional structure. So the dimensions of structure that I'm talking about here are exactly these dimensions that I just talked about in talking about what a perspective in general is. They're dimensions of prominence and centrality. Um, uh, and the vivid, affectively laden features, like often in our intuitive ways of thinking about topics, uh, it's not just sort of abstractly represented contents, but, um, you know, so I, I have images and I have emotional responses to uh, the features that I um, uh, attribute. So to help you get a lock on the kind of phenomenon I'm talking about, stereotypes are the most sort of familiar uh, and probably now, you know, sort of uh, theoretically, uh, cognitively investigated instance of this phenomenon. Um, these intuitive ways of thinking about particular topics, but stereotypes are just a special case of what I'm talking about um, because uh, I take it that stereotypes are culturally shared ways of thinking about kinds, about, uh, about types, um, and I have plenty of uh, characterizations that are idiosyncratic to me and that are of, you know, both that are sort of odd because they're just my own intuitive thinking. Um, and they are about things that nobody else has really strong opinions about, right? Um, so it's that what you can take from the idea of stereotypes is that sort of there are vivid, often vivid images. Uh, there's often, you know, sort of affective and normative uh, inflection. Um, there's the intuitiveness, but you can, again, prescind from it being a culturally shared way of thinking about um, uh, uh, about a, a, a cultural kind. Um, another thing that's sort of in the ballpark of what I'm talking about here are what philosophers sometimes think of as conceptions, where these are sort of encyclopedic entries uh, that are intuitive ways of thinking about a subject. Um, that uh, are richer than uh, the sort of extension determining, um, maybe competence determining uh, content that goes into a concept. Um, so I take it that I have characterizations of women, uh, of boys, of soccer fans. Uh, you know, if I were, I tried to, I talked about, I thought I'd sub in soccer fans. I often think about quarterbacks, you know, I was trying not to be super American. Um, those are all sort of, you know, fall into the ballpark of stereotypes, right? Um, I also have uh, characterizations of, you know, Barack Obama and uh, uh, Donald Trump. Um, I also have characterizations of more abstract topics like Kantianism, right? I have a way of I have a way of understanding what is Kantianism um, and say utilitarianism, right? Um, if I were more scientifically informed, I would have a richer characterization of what genes are. But I, you know, um, but I do have some kind of characterization of genes. Okay, so this intuitive Intuitive way of thinking, which synthesizes a lot of information about a particular subject, um, that's what 
a characterization is, and I want to emphasize that it can span these very different kinds of domains. It may be vivid and affective, but it need not be. Um, it may be culturally shared, but it need not be. Um, and it is the result of applying a perspective to a particular subject. Last thing, and then I know I'm like throwing all these things at you, and then we'll, so we'll have a, a significant pause. Well, I got two more things. Um, as I've talked about them, perspectives are, uh, as I've talked about them, you know, at the, in the introductory section and uh, in this section, perspectives are these amorphous sort of intangible, you know, um, cognitive phenomena. I sort of said, yeah, know what I'm talking about, but I couldn't really point to them. Characterizations, we can get a little bit more of a grip on, you know, especially if we think about, oh, you know, you know the stereotype about something. Um, but they're still, you know, really intangible. Um, so, and um, uh, part of what is uh, one of the things that's characteristic of about perspectives um, is that they are the kinds of things that modulate in contexts and that uh, help us to navigate through contexts. In some cases, very often, we use what I'm calling frames as devices for expressing and regulating perspectives. Right. So a frame, as I understand it, is a representational device. It's a vehicle. It's a thing you can get a hold of. A sent might be a sentence. It might be a slogan. It might be a picture. It might be a cartoon. Right. It's a representational vehicle that crystallizes and expresses a focal perspective, thereby stabilizing intuitive interpretation across a range of contexts and across a range of agents. So it's something you can sort of get a hold of that helps to stabilize these uh, perspectives, these things that are otherwise really intuitive and open ended. So the first case that I thought, you know, the way I started thinking about this is metaphor. Think about what Romeo is giving you or himself or Venvolio when he says, Juliet is the sun. It's not so much a particular set of contents. It's a way of thinking about Juliet, right? Uh, which is affectively laden and vivid and all this stuff. Um, uh, I've also, a, another like really potent and palpable example are slurs, um, which encapsulate ways of thinking about social groups and, uh, 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 well, we can talk about it more. Other kinds of examples are maybe can be as um, uh, potent and as um, for malign, but also positive purposes as metaphor and slurs. I've also been thinking recently about sort of mantras and symbols, right? So you include there, um, you know, um, yeah, mantras are also sort of images. So here, you know, some examples. Uh, uh, a apparently tautologous uh, slogan like boys will be boys, right? That's used, it's trivial in its own uh, uh, semantic content, but it's used to express an open-ended perspective on what being male is like and uh, also what's, you know, all right about it as sort of bemused exasperation. Um, and it applies to a wide range of situations, an open-ended, indefinitely large range of situations. Um, one of my favorites, I just want to say this is not from my own personal life, but whatever, is so that we also, that's again, a sort of culture-wide, you know, uh, boys will be boys is a culture-wide kind of um, slogan. Um, uh, but they could also have more personal, frames can also be more personal. So you might think about somebody who just, you know, develops for themselves the slogan, you know, he's just not that into you as a way of regulating their thinking about a dysfunctional relationship when they tend to slip into these patterns of thinking that are not very, uh, they've decided are not really, you know, um, effective for them. The slogan, the hashtag Black Lives Matter, I think is a really potent example of a frame that crystallizes a, a mode of interpretation that applies to a wide range of circumstances. Um, and then uh, I think both the thin blue line flag and the pride flag are symbols, are, they're non-linguistic, but they're also again symbols that encapsulate a mode of interpretation which applies again in this intuitive open-ended way to a wide range of cases, okay? All right, so those are the three big things that I want to talk about. Um, now, the last thing I want to say before giving you a chance to say what is um, I want to step back a little bit and say how I think, and maybe Ben, this, I, well, I don't know, this is what I thought you might be asking. Um, how do these things I'm talking about, perspectives uh, and the characterizations they produce, how do those differ from the machinery that we're more familiar talking about in philosophy of mind and especially uh, from, you know, belief, of standard propositional attitudes? So the first, there are a range of things to say here, but I want to make um, 
uh, two uh, primary points. The first one is that perspectives, as I've emphasized, are open-ended tools for thought rather than thoughts per se. Right, So they're ways of parsing information rather than particular pieces of information. They don't themselves necessarily make cuts in possibility space. They make it sort of possible to make cuts in possibility space in various kinds of ways. Right, um, So that's about perspectives. As I think about it, perspectives sort of govern the dynamics of intuitive thinking. Um, rather, so, you might say, okay, but what about these characterizations? Characterizations, you said, do have contents, right? They synthesize body, rich bodies of information. So those why aren't those just sets of beliefs? Um, so uh, fair enough. Um, the thing I want to really emphasize is there's this really palpable difference between entertaining and or endorsing um, and getting a characterization, right? So here's where I think, so it's really puzzling and interesting that I've been talking about these things, these cognitive perspectives, ways of making intuitive modes of understanding about uh, of situations and domains in the world. Um, but people, myself included, but everybody loves to go for this perceptual language in this context. What is it that really is like driving talk about point of view and perspective and orientation and viewpoint and, you know, all that? Um, I, the thing I really want to lean on here is this analogy to, and I think it's it's at least an analogy, maybe more than an analogy, to sort of gestalt perception, which is what I've got here on, you know, I'm trying to give it to you here with the figure on the handout, right? So there is this really palpable difference between looking at the figure that I've put on the handout and thinking that's a picture of an old lady or thinking that's a picture of a young lady and seeing it as a picture of an old lady or a young lady, right? So um, normally, you know, if it was, we're not, we were not in the middle of a pandemic and I were actually in the room with you, I'd like survey you and a group of their, you know, 35, two of us. So I would like, you know, survey us and I would find that about at least five people or so like can only see it one way. And, you know, so this kind of digital perception is something that you can try to get trying is not sufficient for actually achieving that intuitive mode of construal. Um, trying helps, but it's not sufficient. Um, uh, when you do get the intuitive way of thinking, um, it locks in uh, and it has a functional difference in, you know, it locks in in a way that has a phenomenological effect, but also more importantly, it has a functional effect, right? You, um, uh, certain pieces of, of certain elements of the figure, are more prominent, they stand out, they're more noticeable to you than they were under the other construal. Um, and uh, they are, they have different significances and they are linked together in different kinds of ways. So in particular, different permutations to the figure would affect or undermine the um, overall figure uh, differently under the two uh, construals. So I think that exactly that same thing is going on in these cognitive cases. What matters and how differs under the two modes of construal and you can endorse sort of at arm's length um, a characterization, the content of a characterization without getting it and you can get a characterization without endorsing it. So um, the way I think about that is that the characterizations which are produced by perspectives are implemented dispositions, they're implemented cognitive structures. So a characterization is an implemented cognitive structure and a perspective is an implemented disposition to form actual cognitive structures, which have, are actually governing your intuitive cognitive processes. Those are partly but not entirely under voluntary control and endorsement is neither necessary nor sufficient. Um, for those. So that's the way in which, the primary way in which I want to sort of um, uh, make sense of uh, and lean on the intuition that perspectives differ from uh, propositional attitudes. All right. Whew. That was the most strenuous section. Uh, let's take a little break. Uh, Try to keep it from spiraling, you know, and taking too much time, but I realize I've just thrown a light at you. So let's have some conversation. So, 
Um, having thrown all that at you, um, I hope that you can now see in a little bit more detail why the sort of thing I said, I said at the beginning about clashes of perspectives would obtain, right? Why um, two or more distinct agents operating with distinct perspectives can generate markedly different characterizations of the same subject in ways that are going to produce markedly different, um, you know, uh, responses, right? So again, you know, people have very different attitudes toward mat wearing a mask, um, toward the latest, you know, um, uh, shooting by police of an unarmed black man, um, of, uh, so those are, you know, politically fraught cases, but also, you know, in a, a marriage, you know, uh, two parties, the, the, the two parties to the couple might have very different characterizations and responses to the unloading or lack thereof of the dishwasher. Um, you might think about the way in which two different, you know, as a, a department faculty come together to create a characterization of, make it reach a decision about whether to award tenure, and that involves getting to a synthetic, um, uh, intuitive characterization of this person's uh, as a professional academic, and you know, people have very different characterizations of the uh, the case. Uh, also, again, more abstract kinds of topics like. Um, um, you know, we have, might have different characterizations and different perspectives on things like minds, right? Are you a computationalist or uh, um, an associationist or whatever? Uh, what do you think justice is, right? So we can see, I think, from the materials I've given you, there are different ways, different taxonomies, different sets of purposes and priorities, um, uh, different values, uh, different assumptions about how uh, features are correlated in the world. All of those are going to drive different patterns of attention and explanation and thereby by produce different kinds of response. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, complacency, right? So why the material I talked about in the last section helps us to understand why what produces this effect of complacency. And that is, so from our own internal perspective, from how we, when we look at how our perspective is functioning, we may appear to be functioning ad admirably, right? So it looks to us like, we're taking in, we're noticing all the relevant information. Um, we're carving it up in categories that uh, are appropriate given our needs and purposes and interests um, that reflect real differences in the world. Um, we're connecting it up in ways that, uh, you know, sort of are grounded in um, uh, well um, uh, justified principles like causation and uh, correlation. Um, and then we're responding in appropriate ways, right? So we can feel like we're doing great, right? We are, notice what we're noticing, we're making sense of it. We have the phenomenology of knowing our way about and knowing how to go on when processing a wide range of information. Um, and the more information we handle, the more we do that, the more we navigate around the world um, using this perspective, the more not just used to it that we become, but the more, and so not just the more habituated we become, but the better confirmed our evidence is that we're doing a decent job, right? We're, after all, there's that much more information that we're handling. There's that much more explanations that we're synthesizing. Um, however, somebody else might deliver a very different verdict on our um, uh, our perspectival functioning. So um, they aren't going to deliver such a different verdict. Um, well, the first thing is attention just like in its nature, especially given the complexity of the world that we inhabit and the finiteness of our cognitive capacities, attention has to be highly selective. Um, and so we don't see what we don't see, right? We don't notice all the things that we're not noticing. Um, and we think that we're pri appropriately prioritizing, but somebody else may have to think that very different um, uh, priorities are appropriate, right? So we don't see what we don't see. So that's about attention, the ways in which attention is always limited, but somebody else might be poised to see those limitations in a way we're not. The second thing is that about explanation or connection, 
any imputation of a general connection between features um, is going to exceed the finite evidence we already have. Like even saying that two properties are correlated goes beyond the evidence we like actually have before us. Um, and so, you know, we just might be getting those connections wrong. Um, uh, we uh, embrace, I think, rightly internal theoretical virtues of we value simplicity, explanatory simplicity. We value uh, explanatory robustness, right? Connecting up many features uh, on uh, in simple terms. We like theories that do that more. Um, but that may be Panglossian. The actual world might actually be messier than that, right? Um, so in particular here, um, we have, and here's a place where I think that the um, the Gestalt phenomenology of understanding, of getting it, is particularly pernicious. So it's not just that we don't notice what we don't notice, and that we can't tell if we're um, not that we're ex that we're imputing connections that we might not be aware that uh, that, that we might take to be well grounded that aren't well grounded, but it's that. Um, it feels like it makes sense, right? In there is the sort of um, the phenomenology of comprehension, um, and so uh, and that's something we really like, um, and that can in itself demotivate us from searching for further features uh, out in the world, um, and it can um, motivate us to minimize the apparently countervailing counter uh, evidential. Uh, information counterexamples. Uh, we can say we either want to um, explain. We don't want to make them highly central to our thinking. We find some way of assimilating, you know, unfitting information into our network of uh, existing intuitive way of thinking about the domain, um, but in a way that doesn't threaten our overall structure. And again, that's uh, you know, it, it can make good rational sense, but it is something that, from another perspective, somebody else may think see or feel to be uh, um, experimentally ill-warranted, non-unwarranted. So I think all of these, the ways in which all of this works and the risks of complacency here, um, of thinking you got it all, uh, you know, uh, on, under control, that you got a good grip on the world when really uh, somebody else would say you don't. I think all this is on really robust um, display in our generic thinking about um, social kinds. Um, so take gender for, you know, one case. Um, so what we see in generic thinking about um, gender is uh, there are a bunch of sort of surface features which uh, we take to be diagnostic, highly so a bunch of separate surface features which we take to be highly to be diagnostic of a deep underlying essence or category, which then is like explanatorily really powerful and uh, you know explains a wide range of uh, further features, um, and it treats those further features as normal for instances of that kind, where normal means um, statistically common, typical. Uh, it means also typical, but could tolerate exceptions. So no particular evidence that comes in is going to falsify uh, my uh, intuitive way of thinking. And it also means normative, right? It's how things should be. Um, and even people, those of us who want to disavow that intuitive way of thinking about gender, find that very difficult to do, right? There's a center of gravity. There's a sort of, you know, um, uh, it, the, the intuitive power of um, perspectively loaded characteriza characterizations of social kinds is powerful enough that we can find ourselves being intuitively sucked into it, even if we reflectively disavow. Okay, so that's the kind of um, on particularly powerful display, but I think more, there's this more general phenomenon of being complacent in your perspective because you, um, you know, it seems to be working for you. So you don't notice what you're, the ways in which it's falling short. So what do you do about it? If we were just saddled with, and this gets to Angela's question, um, if we were just saddled with these things, if we was just, a perspective was just an accumulation of, uh, you know, um, the experiences we've been barraged with in the world, then well, that might be, we might pity some people for their perspectives and not others, but like, 
what can you do about it? It's just your intuitive way of thinking. Um, you, you're implicitly biased, you know, too bad. Um, so, th but that's not the case. These perspectives and characterizations are partially under our voluntary control. So, um, and we can, okay, so perspectives are partially under our voluntary control. So the most powerful antidote to this kind of complacency is the classic thing of open-mindedness, right? So actively trying on alternative perspectives. And we do have access to alternative perspectives. We're not just locked into our existing perspectives. Um, we can do the thing like with the figure of the old lady and young, young lady in real life. Here, novel frames so it's not it's, and again perspectives are themselves so touchy so amorphous so um uh, abstract that it's hard to sort of get a hold on them as such um but frames especially in the form of art can be really powerful mechanisms for accessing and entraining ourselves into alternative perspectives um so uh cognitively trying on cultivating an alternative perspective um, can help us to habituate to principles that right now we only reflectively endorse, right? So we want to endorse this thing, but we notice, maybe we glimpse that our intuitive modes of thinking don't conform. So one way to deal with that is to sort of like just habituate, to inhabit and spend time with alternative perspectives that we do reflectively endorse. Epistemically, and can be useful to cultivate a novel frame um, because they can highlight no even if we think that it's not one we would ultimately want to endorse even if it's not you know one that we've reflectively uh accept um episode can still be useful because they can highlight features that we already know about but that we're neglecting they can help us to see that we're uh neglecting features um they can help to suggest alternative explanations um help to dislodge those assumptions that we uh unreflectively uh accepted um and they can motivate search for new features morally trying on alternative frames can um as you know martha nussbaum likes loves to say and other people like to talk about uh trying alter on alternative perspectives can help us to cultivate our moral imagination both in understanding particular others and maybe also in becoming more imaginatively and um uh perspectively flexible so that we're better able to adjust to uh novel situations uh and situations of other uh in which we're encountering and recognizing others in their difference as we encounter them. And then finally, um, communicatively, being able to try on an alternative perspective, trying to try on an alternative perspective can be um, pragmatically useful because it can help us to put arguments in terms that other people are going to find more congenial, right? And, uh, you know, even just to get the um, it's social goods that we want because we're able to integrate ourselves socially um, with other people. So that's great. You know, that's why we send people to college, right? Is like, you know, open up new worlds to you, read other people with very different points of view, read other texts with very different points of view. That's great. I really deeply believe that. However, it's not just as simple as that. It's not just that open-mindedness is an antidote to complacency. It is that, but it carries its own commensurate risk of, which is the risk of perversion. So, the key thing for me here is that, as I said at the end of section two, um, trying on a perspective, cultivating a perspective, is not just a matter of entertaining a set of, uh, of, um, of, of propositions. It's a matter of instantiating cognitive dispositions, dispositions to interpret. And as a result, trying on a perspective, even temporarily and even instrumentally, even just to see what it's like, even just to understand what other people are like, um, that can shift our default habits in ways that we can't, we don't even necessarily fully notice because of the open-ended and low-level aspect of uh, perspectives, and, and that we may not be able to control even if we do um, notice them. Epistemically, so that's, I think, the, for me, the most pressing worry about perversion. The second thing is that epistemically, um, the click of enlightenment that we get from trying on a new perspective may itself be seduction into a conspiracy theory, right? I think conspiracy theories are so seductive, partly because they offer simple, powerful explanations, right? And that feels really good. Um, it feels like the scales have fallen from our eyes and now we've got it all going on. And that may be an illusion. Um, similarly, <laughs> um, 
we have the feeling after we try on an, uh, an alternative perspective, we have the feeling of having gained understanding. Um, but that may be uh, um, inaccurate, right? We may be like, oh, now I understand what it's like to be a person of this kind, but I'm still coming from my own perspective and reaching out to an alternative mode of construal. And so I'm still doing that using my own interpretive resources. And so I have may have misidentified the target or have only partially achieved the target. Um, and so I might presumptive, presumptuously think I've come to have achieved understanding, again, because of this click of understanding, when I really may have not. Um, and then finally, there's a lot more to say about this, but um, uh, even acknowledging malign perspectives in order to combat them, even saying, I know what you're up to when you're, you know, doing this dog whistle or whatever, that already, that makes us complicit in that perspective and it helps perpetuate that perspective by giving it airtime in our own heads and in the social uh, domain, um, and by demonstrating that it has social currency. So that's something, again, that can be really risky and it can pervert the sort of civic discourse. Okay, so that was the third section, and we already went on too long, so I'm going to just march through into the fourth section. So what I take away from this is perspectives are these double-edged swords. They work for us, but they are essentially limited. Um, they have this self-reinforcing character, um, and they're partially but not entirely under voluntary control. As a result, um, uh, there's this risk of myopia and complacency, of myopic complacency. We can combat that by trying on other perspectives, by being open-minded, but we can never tell, we can never step outside of any particular perspective in order to assess how well it is working or how well, what exactly the relationship is. We can't achieve a sideways on view between two perspectives. Oh, I was supposed to say that a little bit later, um, uh, in order to assess them. And so we're sort of, uh, there's always this risk of perversion. So faced with this conundrum of its perspectives are working for us, but they're also these double-edged swords, what should we do? So there are three classic philosophical responses, which I want to, you know, reject. The first is abjure perspectives in favor of pure rationality, right? Like get rid of all this messy system one uh, stuff and just like be a system two agent. Um, as Brendan was asking, like, just train yourself up to be a good, you know, whatever, car you know, ramsified Carnapian. First of all, I think that's not, um, uh, not actually feasible. Um, given the kind of agents we are. Secondly, I think that, um, and that's not just because perspectives are too causally powerful, it's because we need, and this is part of what I was saying to him earlier, we can't operate unless we have principles for parsing, cross-selecting, and synthesizing information. That is part of what it is to understand, can't, and we need all that in order to respond, right? So we just can't function unless we have something like a perspective. And I worry that if we um, uh, try to uh, abjure them, they're just going to sneak back in in ways that we don't fully perceive. The second um, uh, response, which has been more classically popular, but I think is popular even today, um, is to just double down on your antecedent perspective, right? You have an intuitive way of thinking. It seems right to you by your lights because it's yours. And so you should be, you should jealously protect it and not pervert your sentiments uh, in complacence to any man whatsoever for even a moment. Um, the problem with that, so, so people like Plato and Hume, I think were right to see how risky perspectival play is, how risky open-mindedness is, um, but they were more confident about the rectitude of their perspectives than I think we have the right to be. Uh, and so I think we need to be more humble and be more willing to um, try on alternative perspectives. So I think we're stuck with this problem. Um, finally, uh, there's the sort of like, you know, just be a ecumenical perspectivalist, right? Embrace perspectival relativism. Um, say, well, yes, it's my perspective, and so I like it best, but, you know, you have your perspective, and so, you know, the world is better if we have many perspectives. Um, and uh, so, and I, this is the safest conclusion to sort of, would be the safest conclusion to draw, but 
um, because we can't, it's true, we can't ever step outside of all perspectives to assess how well our own perspective, perspective is doing and different perspectives have different advantages and disadvantages. But I gotta say, and this is sort of what Jenny was asking at the beginning, like some of the, some differences in perspective I can, you know, tolerate or even celebrate, but you know, look people, there are some perspectives out there that are really not ideal and that are really deeply pernicious and we need some grounds. I, when I look at them, I identify within myself a commitment to a non-relativism about perspectives. That's not to say that I think there's absolutely one, you know, best perspective, but there are standards for differentiating and evaluating perspectives. And we need to admit that at the very least we're committed to that in our ordinary practices. So, how should we do that? Um, I want to think it, it's true that perspectives can't be assessed directly for truth because they're these open-ended tools of thought, but I think we can identify a range of um, norms for assessing the value of perspectives, um, their perspectival virtue. So apt perspectives are perspectives, as I'm thinking about it, they reliably generate accurate characterizations, so um, which meet the following. So app perspectives do the following things. They reliably impute actually instantiated base level features to the subjects that they form characterizations of. They parse those base level features using a taxonomy that reflects real categorical differences. That is, that draws distinctions where there are pretty robust, stable, homeostatic clusters of properties, lower level features in the world. Um, and that taxonomy parses the features both in terms of real differences in the world and in terms of operative priorities for the agent, right? So, um, you know, you, you, there might be a perfectly well-formed taxonomy for um, uh, structural engineering, but that's not really appropriate, appropriate uh, as a taxonomy to use in uh, thinking about, you know, elementary school students. Right, that just like they're not, it's not going to serve the ends of that uh, somebody who is, uh, so, so the taxonomy needs to reflect both actual statistical distributions in the world and oper the agent's operative priorities. I'm not going to go through all of my lovely examples um, of ways in which perspectives may be inapt um, because I'll, in the interest of time, but I'm happy to talk about them later. Um, secondly, Perspectives should not just attribute actual instantiated properties in parsed in useful ways. They should allocate attention um, in appropriate ways, right? What does that mean? That means assigning intensity and diagnosticity in ways that reflect the actual statistical distributions of properties in the world. The, you know, what actually should be a high signal to noise ratio, what actually should be um, diagnostic of other features in the world. They should then, they should not just parse and prioritize information in appropriate ways, they should connect information up in appropriate ways, in particular by imputing accurate counterfactual dependencies and causal structures. Um, so by, uh, um, yeah, maybe I'll just keep going and we can talk about this later. So, and you might be getting all the surface level properties right and be going wrong at that deeper level. Right, and you might be even getting like the surface counterfactual properties right and get um, them wrong at a deeper level. And I guess I'll, so I'll say this example because I think it, it's helpful. So you know, Sally Hasslinger has talked about a lot about. Uh, you might take from ha Sally Hasslinger's work, uh, thought about the generic uh, women are subordinate, right? So you might disagree that Jane is subordinate. You might disagree that this action by Jane is an action of being subordinate, an ex example of her being subordinate, subordinated. Um, or you might agree with those things. You might agree that women are in fact subordinated, right? Um, but then you might think that either that's just a superficial um, sort of uh, 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 phenomenon. And if we did a little bit more sort of like advertising, we could change up people's dispositions. It would all, you know, we'd make a big difference in the world. Um, uh, that would be disagreeing. That would be accepting a wide range of uh, features in one person's characterization of women being subordinate while disagreeing at a deeper level, right? Or you might, um, uh, uh, or you might think that these are really deep, uh, counterfactually robust 
uh, patterns, and you might ascribe those either a biological basis or a um, basis in sort of social structures, right? So you could agree with an awful lot about both a um, particular characterization of an individual woman uh, in being submissive or about women in general being submissive and then disagree at this much deeper level um, about the kind of uh, uh, explanatory structures that you want to assign. Um, so, but a good perspective would get those things right, right? Um, as a result of getting the patterns of attention right and the patterns of explanation right, uh, an app perspective would generate coherent evaluative responses, right? It would uh, treat like things alike, respond to them emotionally, morally, and aesthetically, um, both within characterizations and across characterizations. And then finally, an app characterization would employ actually valuable priorities and aims, right? So sometimes we criticize people for being internally inconsistent in their intuitive thinking, treating, uh, you know, what should be like things by their own likes uh, alike, uh, differently. Sometimes we um, mm, uh, don't share or reject somebody's perspective because um, they are employing um, a taxonomy that's just not that useful for us. But sometimes we, reject their priorities and purposes. Uh, and we think that those are not, you know, and that's not something you can assess for truth. That has a, requires a different kind of assessment, but it can be something that we, you can see that they're perspectively well-functioning fully in their own terms and they're reflectively endorsing exactly everything they should be doing, but yet we still want to reject their perspective. So that's what I would say to Jenny there. So, those are our norms for assessing perspectives. I think we can say why perspectives are better or worse than each other, even if we can ever step outside of our own perspective in order to assess that. Um, so what should we actually do, given that we're stuck you know, in a perspective, but not, given that, sorry, we're always already within a perspective, but that we are not ineluctably saddled with any particular perspective, that we have this phenomenon of perspective being partly but not entirely under our voluntary control. What should we do? So I have three things to say. Of course, if I like had more to say, I would be, you know, making a million bucks giving, uh, you know, saving the world right now. But I have three things to say. Um, the first is, uh, and I think this is a kind of Aristotelian point, we should cultivate resilient, flexi flexible perspectival habits. So mostly we should inhabit apt interpretive, interpretive environments. We should read news sources that we take to be mostly accurate. We should hang out with and be friends with people that we take to be, that we find congenial and take to be sort of like perspectively, you know, reliable and who we empathetic with. But that's, and that is part of what we, how we train ourselves up into being um, perspectival agents that we respect. But we shouldn't, the risk there is of complacency, right? And so what we should, to mitigate the risk of complacency, we should make periodic, genuinely sincere, empathetic forays into an alien milieus. milieus. We should try to stretch ourselves perspectively. Um, it's risky, but we should go for it. And when we do, we shouldn't just sort of slide back into our old or somewhat modulated perspectival habits. We should try to modulate, we should try to interrogate and uh, see how do those perspectives differ? How, which aspects do we want to try to habituate ourselves to and which we would try to, try to reject? So that's the first thing. The second thing is we should use logic to help ourselves out. So part of one of my themes is, you know, you can't just rely on logic alone, right? We need perspectives as intuitive ways of um, engaging with the particular situations that we're in in real time. Um, but that doesn't mean that logic is, uh, you know, our enemy, right? Um, so in particular, Logic is a tool for articulating in cross-contextually stable ways our commitments and integrating those uh, uh, commitments in consistent ways. And so we should use that. It's a great thing. So we should use that in order to take what is typically an amorphous, tacit, um, uh, modulating, messy patterns of thinking and make them more articulate 
articulate and to reflect upon them. So we should articulate our first order and then structural commitments um, and our normative commitments um, and try to impose consistency across on them. Um, and I think this is actually something we do a lot, not just in philosophy classes, but like in arguing about interpretations of movies or, you know, in talking with a friend about whether they should break up with their partner or whatever, right? We like, I think we talk about what kinds of perspectival commitments we have and try to and argue them out. And then finally, um, we should expect, uh, you know, we should celebrate and recognize and celebrate the our desire for theoretical virtue in the form of simple, powerful theories. We should recognize why frames which encapsulate perspectives are so useful for us in thinking. Um, but we should beware the sort of seductive power of simplicity and the seductive uh, power of uh, frames in particular. So we should expect that as our understanding of any tolerably complex domain grows, that we will replace catchy slogans of, you know, uh, any kind of, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to pick, like, minds or computers, say, um, any kind of catchy slogan, which might be really useful at a given point of inquiry or in a given stage of understanding, um, we should expect that to be replaced by more multidimensional, multi-layered um, theories, ways of thinking. And then the challenge is to get a really intuitive understanding of those in their complexity that doesn't just sort of, you know, open the floodgates entirely to, um, that preserves enough of the selectivity and um, connectivity of perspectives to make them uh, sufficiently conducive to achieving genuine understanding. All right, that's it. <laughs>